Frank and Deborah Popper are visiting here from Rutgers University, where uh, Frank is on the faculty and uh, Deborah is a visiting scholar. Um, Dr. Popper, Frank Popper, has a degree in uh, government and public administration from Harvard University, and uh, Deborah draws her degrees from Rutgers University in geography. Uh, they've both been working in the planning department, planning studies, or urban studies and planning at Rutgers University in New Jersey. And they've come up with some very interesting ideas about the Great Plains states. These ideas of theirs have been uh, quite controversial in some sectors of America and have been picked up by the mainstream press from papers as far away as Los Angeles and Washington, D.C. and the Boston Globe. The New York Times has done quite a lot with the article on a couple occasions, and a woman who writes for New York Times Magazine has put out a book about their ideas called Where the Buffalo Roam. And her name is Ann Matthews, if anybody would like to uh, find that. The, buff the poppers are going to talk about their idea for the Buffalo Commons, and I uh, hope you'll enjoy it. We'll have a time for questions uh, after they finish. And uh, Frank Popper will start their presentation, and then Deborah Popper will do the second half. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Uh, is this on? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and Deborah and I would also like to thank all the organizations that made this really atmospheric occasion possible. Uh, Deborah, could you stand up for a minute? Ann Matthews' book about our work was reviewed in USA Today, where the USA Today reviewer described the poppers as, quote, as fearsome as buffalo to many of the residents of the Great Plains. Now I ask you. Today, Deborah and I would like to tell you about the work we've been doing on the agricultural and economic and environmental and land use future of the Great Plains. We'll focus on why that work convinces us that much of the fate of the Plains lies in a vision that we've called the Buffalo Commons. We'd like to spell out some of the details of that vision because they've been frequently misunderstood, in part because they've been frequently misunderstood. Just so we start from the same point of view, same reference point, let me show you the area that we mean by the Great Plains. Upside down, what do you mean? <laughs> Now, the area that we consider the Great Plains, and I should say it's a very standard historian's, geographer's uh, definition, going back, for example, to the work of the Great Plains historian Walter Prescott Webb in 1931. Uh, for us, for Webb, for lots of other people, the Great Plains begins at the 98th meridian, a solid line running from North Dakota to Texas. Uh, if it helps, the solid line was about, say, where Aurora, Nebraska is, or where Hutchinson, Kansas is. The west edge of the plains, and again, part of the standard definition, is the wavy dotted line there to the west, which is the easternmost extension of the Rockies. The region consists of, by this definition, parts, and that may become important later when we we go again to the question. Parts of 10 states, no one state is actually totally within the plains. The area as defined here accounts for almost a fifth of the land area of the contiguous United States. It has a distinctive grass pattern, short grass and mixed grass, has a distinctive soil profile, crop output, geology, elevation, and most obvious to the, to the eyeball, uh, relatively little in the way of trees, and rainfall is relatively sparse. If you go from east to west, annual rainfall drops below 
uh, on an average basis, 20 inches of rain a year. Uh, we've shown San Antonio on the east edge of the plains here, Denver on the west edge of the plains. But the largest city actually in the plains is Lubbock, Texas, uh, about 170,000 people. Uh, think of that. I mean, here you have a fifth of the United States, and the largest city in it is the size approximately, in fact, slightly less than Des Moines. Uh, it is, on the whole, as is very well known, a rural and small town place. Total population of the plains, as of the latest census, is about 6 million people, maybe a little bit over that. That makes it about the size of a middle-sized state like Georgia or Indiana, as I say, on a fifth of the contiguous United States. It's a very evocative area in American history. This is the area, legendarily at least, of the pioneer homesteads, of the big sky, the dust bowl, one-room schoolhouses, straight-line interstates, custom combines, prairie dogs and antelope, and yes, buffalo. It's the locus of novels like Giants in the Earth, and movies like The Last Picture Show, and most recently, and of course very evocatively, Dances with Wolves. It has an interesting literary history, in fact, the Great Plains does. A lot of the early 19th century, mid 19th century, uh, great American writers spent a surprising amount of time in the Plains. Here I'm thinking uh, not just of George Catlin, but also of uh, Washington Irving and Walt Whitman, and basically all of them were captivated by the oceans of grass, vistas, intimations of infinity that the Plains offer. Uh, the region's history, and again, this is a very standard interpretation, shows a basic pattern. Federally subsidized settlement and cultivation produce a boom. That boom then goes too far. It leads to overgrazing and overplowing. These then lead to a bust, which features heavy depopulation, especially heavy, in the deepest rural parts of the plains. So it's a region that historically shows this boom and bust, highly unstable economic pattern. Two such cycles have already run full term in the American period already. One in the late 19th century, the other in the early 20th century. The first began with the Homestead Act in 1862, then immediately after the Civil War, running through a lot of the 1870s, there was very heavy settlement in the Plains. The 1870s period happened to coincide, quite coincidentally, with a period of relatively high, deceptively high, rainfall in the Plains. But beginning in the 1880s, there was a series of very difficult winters, heavy cattle die-ups, uh, beginning in the late 1880s and running through the 1890s, there was what we would now call a depression that hit the plains, hit the country as a whole, hit the plains especially hard. So that by about 1895 or so, Nellie Bly, the famous reporter uh, for the New York World, was chronicling, writing about fully loaded wagon trains of settlers headed east out of the plains in Nebraska and Kansas, no doubt heading many of them back into Iowa, the defeated settlers of the first cycle of settlement on the plains. The second such cycle, as I mentioned, began early in the 20th century. There were new homesteading laws that allowed larger parcels of land to be homesteaded, up to 640 acres by about 1916. And again, there were some good years. Early 1910s were very good. Again, I believe rainfall was very high. Uh, and then the World War I hit. And it made, World War I did, the wheat produced by the Plains an enormous strategic asset for the Allied cause. 
Uh, if you recall World War I history, most of the main battles of World War I in France or Belgium or Russia or what is now Ukraine were actually fought in or near former wheat fields and often by people who in peacetime would be tending, cultivating those wheat fields. Under wartime conditions, they could not. This made the wheat of Montana and Kansas and Nebraska, uh, as I say, a great strategic asset. The slogan of the time was, wheat will win the war, and these were very good years for the plants. That was the high point of that cycle. The cycle soon turned. Uh, there were locusts in the early 20s. A rural depression hit the Great Plains uh, in 1921, followed by the National Great Depression in 1929, and then finally the ecological catastrophe of the Dust Bowl, beginning in 1933. These two cycles, the late 19th century one and the early 20th century one, decisively demonstrate for many observers, not just for Deborah and me, but for many observers, the economic and demographic marginality or at least the very heavy difficulty of settlement on much of the Great Plains. And the cycles, the two cycles in the past and the one going on now, third one, are cumulative. They add on to each other. And as a result, there are large numbers of deep rural plains towns and counties that had their high year of population in 1930 or 1920 or even in a surprising number of cases, 1890, and have been steadily losing population ever since. Uh, there's an old saying on the plains, there's been two good years of agriculture, 1916 and next year. The, uh, the overall story of the plains, in terms of these cycles, demonstrates very clearly with the great, again, Plains historian, this time from the University of North Dakota, Elwin Robinson called the too called the too much mistake. He was writing it, if I recall, 1966, looking back on Plains history. For Robinson, the too much mistake basically is what I've just been describing to you in terms of these cycles. Too many people, too many railroads, too many farms, too many roads, too much cultivation, too much for the land to take land, nature, the economy, eventually rebel. Thus the cycle, thus the instability, and thus the cumulative aspect of those cycles of instability. They're adding on to each other. Now, Deborah and I, writing in Planning Magazine in December of 1987, argued that in the 1980s, a new such cycle was clearly, clearly evident. Its roots, in fact, went back to the 1940s with the onset of large, modern, contemporary federal agriculture subsidies. But that it was ongoing as of the late 80s. And we also argued in, the, in 87 that this cycle was likely, was likely to go lots farther than the two previous ones. Right in, in the late 80s, we had lots of evidence. The agriculture and energy economies of the Great Plains were in near depression. There was continued depopulation, and not just of newcomers, now of people who themselves or their ancestors had been able to withstand the two previous turns of the cycle. There were heavy rises in soil erosion by the late 80s, and by some measures, uh, these rises in short soil erosion, erosion in some places actually approached Dust Bowl 1930-style rates. There have been drawdowns in the Ogallala Aquifer, uh, which is a giant limestone water-bearing formation that essentially underlies the southern two-thirds of the plains. Even changes in American dietary habits had shifted against the plains. By 1987, Americans already consumed only two-thirds of the uh, beef per capita that they were consuming in 1975. For that uneaten beef, they were substituting in their diets fish, mainly, and chicken. The Plains didn't produce either of those. 
so that the shift in dietary habits was harming the plains. Also by the late 80s, the federal government no longer built, or had decided rather, no longer to build the large dam and irrigation projects, say like the one along, ones along the Missouri River uh, in the northern half of the plains that had done so much in the past to underwrite Great Plains economic development. Now, that's what we were saying in late 87. Since 87, a number of new pressures on the plains have emerged, and the ones I've just described have largely persisted. Let me describe some of the new ones for you. 88, 89, and 90 saw serious drought, especially in the northern plains. From 88 onward, there was the savings and loan collapse, which in truth actually seems to have begun in plains, rural plains, Oklahoma and Texas, as we all know, it's still it's in spread nationally. Uh, but there's no question that the savings and loan collapse came earliest to the southern plains and seems perhaps to have lingered longest there. Since 87, there has also been growing credibility for the greenhouse effect. And while the various models of what the effect will actually do to the plains vary a lot in their details, most of them are not really very happy in their main lines for what will happen to agriculture in the southern, say, half of the plains. And again, on the sort of front of perversity, even American foreign policy has shifted, as it were, against the plains. Those of you who've traveled, say, in the Dakotas or Montana or Wyoming will have noticed a large number of missile silos and Air Force bases, uh, most of whose targets essentially were the former Soviet Union. As the former Soviet Union looks less menacing to the, to the true interests of American national security, and as the federal budget deficit becomes more pressing, many of these bases in the northern plains will become more and more, and, and silos in the northern plains, will become more and more expendable. Uh, North Dakota supposedly is the world's third greatest nuclear power. Uh, as those silos are dismantled or uh, made less prevalent, the actual economic impact they offer to the Northern Plains is going to go away, and there's going to be a lot of local hurt as far as we can see. On still yet another front, the nation has become much more dubious about the farm subsidies that underlie a lot of Great Plains agriculture. Uh, the 1990 Farm Bill actually lowered some of the prices paid for uh, plains or subsidies paid paid for Plains commodities, and the early indications from the Clinton administration are that the, that the new USDA uh, will, in the next farm bill, likely lower some of those subsidies even further. Other indications from the new Clinton administration come from the Interior Department, which seems to want to, for example, increase the prices of, fed, of money, of, of, excuse me, of water from federal uh, dam and irrigation projects. Historically, the Plains and a lot of the rest of the West have gotten uh, these water subsidies or these, these, these water rentals at well below market price. It's a form of subsidy. It is likely to be diminished some. So also is the land rental on BLM, Bureau of Land Management land. Uh, which again historically has been below market. BLM has heavy holdings in Plains, Montana, Wyoming, and New Mexico, and these changes in land and water prices on the part of BLM uh, are likely to amount to, assuming they go through of course, a revocation of what has been in the past a substantial subsidy. Above all, however, since 1987, the most striking thing has been the continued outflow of population, particularly young people, from the plains. The 1990 census, for example, showed continuing population hemorrhages in the plains, especially in the rural plains. Uh, as defined here, Nebraska has 52 counties in the plains. 
50 of them showed population losses in 1990 as against 1980. Uh, North Dakota had 41 counties in the plains. 38 of them showed population losses in the 1990 census. Oklahoma had 23 uh, plains counties. 22 of them showed population losses. And in fact, across all 10 plains states, in every single one of them, the majority of plains counties showed population losses. Of course, going across the plains, some counties were hit harder than others. And in particular, the biggest proportion of losses seemed to occur in the smallest and often the most remote and most rural counties, that is, the ones that were already falling behind the most economically. Now, I want to emphasize that this ongoing depopulation of the deep rural plains is an evolutionary process. It's largely, but not entirely, largely free market driven. That is, stated simply, people are voting with their feet. They are, however reluctantly, and despite their determination and their deep love of the land with which Deborah and I fully sympathize, they're leaving the deep rural plains. They may not want to necessarily, their families may not want them to, their communities may not want them to, they're feeling they have to do so anyway. That is, again, in the Elwyn Robinson, too much mistake manner, nature and the economy are taking their course. If this process continues, and Deborah and I think it has so much momentum and such profound roots that it most likely will, then in about a generation, large parts of the rural plains will be extensively depopulated. Not totally depopulated, but certainly more depopulated than they are today. We've done very rough estimates of the likely extent of these areas using census and other publicly available figures and project very roughly that about 110 counties representing about a quarter of the land area of the plains could be possibilities for this continued heavy depopulation we're talking about. They have this quarter of the land area, quarter of the number of counties, only 6% of the total population of the plains, which again would give you a sense of how comparatively underpopulated they are already. They have a total population of about 400,000 people. These are the kinds of places that we think are possible candidates to become part of the Buffalo Commons, which Deborah will now tell you about. someplace like this. I'm not sure whether Frank shouldn't, start, shouldn't have started this out as singing the Great Plains Blues or something. <laughs> uh, to, to pick up where he left off, when we first began talking about and writing about the Buffalo Commons, we were really using a metaphor as a way of re-envisioning the practices in an area that he clearly experienced difficulties um, over the course of decades, really. A loss of income, loss of topsoil, loss of water, loss of people, and loss of community. And so we were trying to discuss and describe and think about where present practices were proving unworkable, what could be done, what could be a re replacement practices. And we expected that the trends that Frank described to you would continue pretty much along the same lines over the next generation. And only at that point, only after these trends and the effects of them had become so overt, so clear, would they be confronted head on. Um, and we expected that at that point, only then, as I say, when things had become so clear, would, would say government feel obliged to do something. 
as government generally waits for extreme uh, problems to actually get in and do something. And so we hope that its actions would incorporate an ethic that treated land and people with respect. We wrote of tearing down the fences, replanting the grasses, restocking the animals, including the bison, and creating the buffalo commons. But remember, the term was thought of by us as a metaphor. And as a metaphor, it was supposed to really be evocative. We, we discovered it was provocative for many rather than evocative, but that was our intent. Now, the first term, buffalo, was supposed to evoke the region's past, one that might suggest lessons to us. And so what were these lessons, really? Um, largely ones of the wisdom of less intensive use of the land, the importance of ecological diversity, and I think the need to look at what distinguished the region, what were the particularities of it that one should keep in mind and should value and try to emphasize, perhaps. So were there practices in this past that could be brought forward into the future? Not to recreate it, since after all, that's really not possible, but to really learn from it. Were there things that were done better in the past that might suggest ways of approaching the present? Now, the second term, commons, um, really would refer to the need to value the land as a resource that we all have an interest in, much like air and water. And so private property rights should not supersede the common good on these lands, but instead they really need to be held in balance. Public interest, general you know, community interest, as well as the individual's interest. So what kinds of practices would be suggested by such a metaphor? It really didn't mean to us buffalo on every acre. In fact, you couldn't have buffalo on every acre since that wouldn't be sustainable over the long term. And what we have found since we started writing, this is, I guess, in 1987, is that there, we've seen many practices springing up around the area uh, much faster than we anticipated. And whereas we had expected that only you know, the government would be the really most critical player, um, we found strong private and private public kinds of actions occurring. Um, and most of them really originate from within the region. So let me give you some examples of the kinds of things we've seen emerging, and the kinds of changes that have been taking place. Cattle and wheat, the region's prime agricultural products, ecologically mimic the natural Great Plains. Um, but in many places, they don't renew it really economically or ecologically. So restocked buffalo, not domesticated, because they really are not tame animals, but, but managed really, offer one example of buffalo bringing past and future together. Um, private bison ranching, in fact, is on the upswing in the plains. It's really, we found lots and lots of people suddenly getting into this. Um, lots of ranchers around the area. And in, in preference to cattle, those who have made this change have told us that it's economically viable. And in fact, uh, it's a lot easier to do, requiring less labor on their part. They find buffalo graze more widely than cattle, certainly both because they don't you know, favor a wider range of grasses and also are more willing to leave the riparian areas. Uh, they survive adverse weather conditions more easily. Um, they bring good prices, and both for the, the meat, which at least up through now has been basically organic um, and lower in cholesterol than beef, and so therefore fits into the sort of growing demand that Frank was talking about, you know, sort of away from sort of high cholesterol beef. And then also horns, skins, and so on bring good prices as well. So you've got a, a you know, good range of things that you can get money from. So those who we have talked with have found that the anticipated problems of fencing and brucellosis, which were certainly you know, the big uh, things that uh, have been raised as why you really can't go into this, have been, in fact, uh, something that they could manage, they can deal with, they can inoculate. If you manage your buffalo, they won't jump your fences, although they probably can if they really want to, no matter how high you build them and how strong. 
In North Dakota, in fact, last February, about 100 ranchers or so got together and formed the North Dakota Buffalo Producers Association. Uh, with the intent of establishing their own slaughterhouse, doing joint marketing, and so on. And in fact, they have just selected a, slight, a site for that slaughterhouse in, in New Rockford, North Dakota. And several towns you know, put together serious bids you know, wanting that particular business, so they're real pleased about that. There have been associations springing up of buffalo producers in Kansas and Wyoming as well. So you can see this as a, basically a growth sector. And at this stage in the development of the buffalo industry, producers can still take control and hopefully keep control, uh, avoiding the sort of large scale corporate organization that has really overtaken much of the meat industry. So raising bison in this way seems to be a way to diversify the region's economy and you know, sort of part of the sort of region's niche agricultural market. And it works on some of the more arid land uh, in the region. So that's one kind of thing we've seen springing up that's, I think, a pretty positive sign. Native Americans are actively pursuing initiatives to restore the place of buffalo in their culture for both economic and spiritual purposes. Uh, and there's a Native American Fish and Wildlife Society, which is uh, in conjunction with about uh, more than 20, between 20 and 30 tribes, uh, worked on a project which would uh, include increasing or creating um, bison herds on many of these reservations also have talked about doing uh, their own slaughtering and doing their own management, doing their increasing and improving management uh, and developing marketing skills as well. Uh, so they've formed an intertribal bison cooperative for all of this. Uh, in addition, several individual tribes, the Lakota, for example, have put forth similar proposals. Um, and they really do stress the need to incorporate the bison into tribal life as well as the economics. In fact, I think uh, we had read somewhere that there has been some resistance or, uh, to joining the North Dakota slaughterhouse, uh, in fact, because it might not incorporate the uh, ability to do kind of slaughtering in as a sort of spiritual ritual. So they would like to keep that independent. But it, 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 so it's very clearly got n numerous different threads that it, it resonates with there. And additionally, uh, individual tribes are encouraging their own members to get into private buffalo ranching for themselves on their own private uh, land as well. Okay. Another kind of buffalo commons land use we see emerging. Uh, is that some plains farmers and ranchers have found their land really more valuable as habitat for game than as farmland. And they've made their living from fees paid by individuals who, or groups who come out to hunt. That's, in some cases they farm and they rent out the land in this manner. In other cases, basically this becomes their primary focus. Um, but you can again see this as a sort of private buffalo commons emerging. Another example, the Nature Conservancy, the nation's leading land preservation organization, paid little attention really to the plains um, until about five years ago or so. And since then, they have begun to buy up to preserve or restore um, different sections in the plains and looking at various ecosystems that they consider to be particularly <laughs> sensitive um, and made contacts with an awful lot of landowners. One of their most ambitious projects is in, uh, is in Texas, where um, they're working with a number of other groups, local governments as included, um, and thinking about the relationships between um, different uh, areas within about an 18,000 square mile region, pretty large region. So it's around the Austin, Austin and the Hill Country and then west from there. And so within that area, they've been setting up some wilderness preserves then designating sort of buffer zones and basically sort of doing this with an eye to you know, what is particularly ecologically important and perhaps preservable land at this point, uh, what the population within the area would be interested in maintaining and having access to and so on. So preservation is not just for the land's sake there but also for the local populations. And there are numbers of other groups, whether private like the Nature Conservancy or public, that are considering things like this as well. Uh, certainly, uh, Bruce Babbitt, uh, Secretary of the Interior, has been talking about 
the new environmental policies and, and describing them very much as uh, he feels moving in the direction under, their, uh, under the Clinton administration to pay closer attention to ecosystem decisions rather than specific species. You know, preserving one you know, endangered species without thinking of the larger context. And thinking about doing this within, uh, you know, sort of mixing public and private groups together to come up with plans to do this. So I think that, th that this particular way of dealing with things is, is certainly more in line with what this present administration is talking with. Now, another example, I think, is the, the um, or possibly the largest scale existing example of a buffalo commons land use is actually Canadian. The prairie provinces have long experienced the same kinds of pressures that the lower 48 have, have felt. And so they basically, in Canada, have established a public buffalo commons. They've opened in southwest Saskatchewan along Frenchman River, Grasslands National Park. And it borders Montana. Um, it's it basically, I think, in two parts, and it's about 350 square miles. Uh, and they've talked, and what they've largely concentrated on is basically restoring native grasses to the area. And they've talked about putting in bison. They have it by, thus far, as far as I know. Now, farmers and ranchers in the area initially were very skeptical and not terribly happy with the plan when they first heard it. Um, but subsequently, as they re-examined their own situation, have decided that, in fact, what they're unhappy with now is a slow case of the buyout. You know, the, the, uh, the prices that they were, have been paid have been fair, and nobody has been forced out. So in fact, they've want, you know, there have been ranchers in, uh, in the area who felt, wait a minute, why doesn't this go forward faster? Uh, this is really what we need in this, in this area. So that's an, a, another example, but it's Canadian. Now, I think these several examples can be viewed as building blocks, really, of a Buffalo Commons, along with a variety of other previously established ones, like the National Grasslands, which appear only in the Great Plains, uh, created during Dust Bowl days um, out of land that was basically left, or Bureau of Land Management acreage, uh, which is largely land that never went out of public hands. And I think that these examples all really reflect a change or expansion, if you will, in the way land is valued from the tr deeply ingrained notion that land is valuable when it is plowed or sold or developed, that intensity of use is desirable, to an attitude that sees some land as really better treated more ging gingerly. So what might the Great Plains look like a generation from now when Frank and I expected something like the Buffalo Commons to start to materialize? Now, well, what I think, and you know, obviously I don't know what it's going to look like, but what I, uh, I, what I would expect is that much of the region will appear to continue in present patterns overall, though we expect to see some broad shifts, a sort of gradual reordering of population centers and the relationships between them. We expect to see both an increase in frontier and an increase in urbanization in the region. The urban areas are really likely to grow, picking up out migrants from both the more rural sections of the plains, as well as from urban areas to the east and west, people really seeking a more manageable urban environment. So places like Billings, Montana, or Lubbock, Texas, or Cheyenne, Wyoming, the largest cities in the plains, really, with their populations of 50, 80, 100,000, are likely to be bigger than they are now. And I think so are the, some of the smaller urban areas, like, say, Aberdeen, South Dakota, or Alliance, Nebraska, or, or Elk City, Oklahoma, with their more typically 10 to 20,000. These two will pick up, I think, especially the more, um, that's sort of the first place that the deep rural people go in, in their, in, in their, when they move out of the, the deep rural plains. Now, the vast bulk of plains farming and ranching and mining areas that are economically stable, I think, will remain. The region, after all, produces most of our wheat, and we expect it to continue to do so. But I think these activities may cover less land area than they do now. They may occur really in the areas 
where they prove most workable, most resistant to boom and bust, uh, places that are more reliable sources of water, for example, where they have raised difficulties, I think, where the free market has indicated their unsuitability, they will retract. And frontier-like conditions, I think, will increase there. And so the question is, what will arise in their place? That's where we expect the kinds of private and public Buffalo Commons land uses I've talked about to emerge. There could be other uses which emerge there, but that's really where we see them as likely. And in, in some ways, we see these as positive ones. Or very definitely, we see them as positive ones. So we would like to see in these areas which are not viable economically, replacement uses that incorporate high environmental values and high aesthetic values and high human values. We foresaw the Buffalo Commons as a unitary, large-scale entity when we first started writing. And it may be. Or it may instead be a variety of improvisations, smaller improvisations. But the region's economy, we expect, will be healthier if it features a larger role, an important role, for preservation, for tourism, especially ecotourism, for recreation, with more land devoted to wildlife refuges and parks and with larger populations of native species. But whatever our vision, the reality, I think, will be created on the plains by the people of the plains. Now, I think such areas can, in fact, have economic value and offer opportunities for people. As I say, we expect an increase in ecotourism and other forms of recreation with jobs that they bring. But to do these things right really requires more than an increase in low-paying service jobs. Um, it requires people who know how to foster a vital ecosystem, who can do the complex research to figure out what the land used to look like, who can make informed guesses about what happens when certain species are introduced or omitted, and can react intelligently when their guesses prove wrong. Okay. Now, as will inevitably happen, I'm sure. Um, it will need people to increase, for example, the seed stock of native grasses, which, if one does real restoration, uh, is certainly much too small at the moment. And it will also need people to explain these same ecosystems to lay people in ways that really communicate their value and make them enticing and exciting and worthwhile, to make the visitors to the plains see it uh, and understand it and value it. Now, so the, I think I wonder how we will treat the environment, what values we will bring to creating the places in which we live. Now, in 1936, at the height of the Dust Bowl, the federal government published a report called The Future of the Great Plains. And this report concluded that the Plains difficulties ultimately sprang from what they called controlling attitudes of mind that Americans historically had towards land. Nature was to be conquered. Habitual practices are best. Natural resources are inexhaustible. Markets would expand indefinitely. Land values would keep rising. And these attitudes gave rise to practices that really could not be sustained. Now, these attitudes certainly still persist. Anybody who wants to sell a house knows that they still hope that iron values keep rising after all. But we think they are increasingly being superseded. There seems to be a growing willingness, indeed desire, to recognize limits. The limits don't dictate specific land uses, but practices need to take them into account and work with them. And so we see increasing experimentation within these limits. And increasing experimentation and incorporating wilderness into our land use fabric. So how will we view the landscape of the Great Plains a generation from now? What will we actually see when we look at it? Will we only notice the urban oases? Or will it be a breadbasket entirely tamed? Will much of it been have been turned into a wasteland as people leave the deep rural areas? Will new uses emerge 
uh, for those places and the waste dumps find their ways to the formerly overgrazed land. Will it be replete with crops and grass that we see without understanding, finding it really an endless, boring, scrubby vista, flat, nothing there? Or will we be thrilled by it instead? Will it evoke the response Walt Whitman had to it when he crossed the country in the 1870s? He wrote, the plains, while less stunning at first sight, last longer, fill the aesthetic sense fuller, precede all the rest, and make North America's characteristic landscape. We hope we can honor that landscape and let it fulfill the promise that Whitman saw in it, allowing it to provide different kinds of bounty to the people of the nation, wheat where it belongs, grass where it belongs, people where they belong, and even buffalo where they belong. Thank you. We'd be happy to take questions or whatever. So, anybody? Questions, comments? I have a question. <laughs> I'm Doug Hurt from the Department of History. I teach a course in the Great Plains. So I'm very interested in, in what you have to say. And I haven't read the uh, your work. Your critics, uh, perhaps not legion, are many, uh, particularly on the Great Plains. And they say a number of things. I'm wondering how you respond to them. One of which is that you fail to distinguish between sustainability and exploitation. Uh, they say to the extent that uh, you don't adequately distinguish as well between sub-marginal land use and marginal land use. And still others would say that uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense to substitute buffalo for herbivores ecologically. Uh, in fact, it may be the demographically delicate place that is getting pushed farther and farther toward the edge given the, the existing traditional forms of agriculture and other development there. Our sense is very strongly that <coughs> preservation-oriented alternatives will have to be developed in other deep rural parts of the country that are experiencing, maybe not to the same extent, but certainly going in the same direction, these depopulation pressures. Uh, there are lots of these other places around the country. I'm thinking here of the rural Pacific Northwest or the Great Basin or the Colorado Plateau in the western part of the country. Uh, the same thing, in fact, is largely true if you look at, say, central Appalachia, a place like eastern Kentucky. The same thing is largely true if you look at the, the lower Mississippi Delta. The same thing is true in the most northern parts of the Midwest. All of these places are places where traditional agriculture, traditional extractive industries don't really seem to be have, have much of a future. Young people are leaving, populations getting older, uh, a lot of government policies, uh, some, of, some long standing seem to drive this depopulation even further. Some kind of alternative, we think preservation oriented, is going to have to be developed for many of these places. Our sense is, as I say, the process has gone farthest in the Great Plains and that other parts of the country are eventually, we think, going to have to develop some kind of locally adapted version of the Buffalo Commons on their own for their own rural selves. Your first point interested me. It was something but about the- I was saying that uh, some of your critics say that you don't distinguish between exploitation and sustainable agriculture in your plans for readjustment of the great place. Okay, I, I, I'd argue, De Deborah, did you want to get in? Oh, I could. <laughs> Wait, you're, you're about to say something, so I'll say something after. Well, you probably have something better to say. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> never do. Okay. We, but my, my, my own sense is that's based on a misunderstanding of our work, this distinction between exploitation and sustainable development. Our sense is very strongly, well, all right, excuse me, a more frequent and more, shall we say, uh, in your face criticism of our work is we want to move people off the land who are doing fine as it is, economic, 
And I would argue to you that if you look at our work and listen to what we've said, we've never said anything well, I like that. Saying, but people in Nebraska understand it. Okay, but yeah, okay, but I think okay, but what I think I heard you say is a kind of polite academic euphemistic way of saying the same thing. Our actual work, if you listen to it closely, allows people excuse me, allows people, which is if we have any control over the situation. Don't it says people economic enterprises, farms, ranches, mining, whatever, that is doing fine in place, should have no earthly reason to move, and we and anybody associated with us should have no designs on it. However, there are so many places, as we, as we say, we estimate about a quarter of the counties of the plains fall in this category, where traditional ranching, traditional farming, traditional uh, mineral exploitation is so clearly failing and in truth historically has been failing in many of these places for more than a century that it's so obvious that some new pres that some new preservation uh, oriented use should come into its place. One odd thing that happens here in these, shall we say, less polite exchanges, it's nice to be here in this academic setting and, you know, looking around the bar and the, the lights are only blinding me about 50%. I don't think you can realize that from where you stand. I, I now have much more appreciation for, say, rock music performers, in fact. I mean, they're, they're doing their stuff half one. Um, one of the things we are frequently accused of is foisting some kind of social engineering, social experiment approach on a place that doesn't want it, okay? That, I think, is a complete misunderstanding, one, of what we as academic researchers have within our tentacle-like powers. I mean, we can't force anything on anybody. The fact is, however, that for the most part, the traditional mining, agriculture, uh, ranching that is failing in these quarter of counties, that's the actual social experiment, supported by government going back at least to the Homesteading Act supported by the contemporary subsidies, supported by uh, past Bureau of Land Management and Bureau of Reclamation policies. And this is a century-long social experiment that in these places, not all of the plains, but in these places, is not showing such great results. And we're simply suggesting that there may be a more free market alternative to that, that reverses the political polarities. We're not the federally oriented social engineers, they are the recipients of federal largesse for 100, 130 years, and it's not working. We're saying, look at economic reality. Look at environmental reality. These are failing towns, failing counties, dropping water tables, mounting soil erosion, young people leave, counties are getting older and older, they're depending very heavily often on agricultural or other subsidies that don't seem to have that much of a future. We're simply saying, look at the alternative to this century or more of ragged performance. I think actually, let me just respond slightly differently, but it's sort of along the same lines. Uh, two things. One is that what we're talking about is, a, is another form of sustainable development. And so we're not saying that everybody has to do this. We're saying, can we, in fact, increase the pool of things we do that qualify as sustainable development? So I think that's really the most direct response I have to that. The, the other thing, though, that I, th I think um, is, I don't know that we're confusing exploitation. I think there are cases on the plains of ex clear exploitation if, in fact, you're mining the Ogallala Aquifer for your agriculture, that is, you are taking out a whole lot more water than you're than going to come back into it, you are exploiting. There's no question about it. it you can't say you're not, that that's sustainable. You'd have to come up with an alternative practice that didn't use up the water to say that it was sustainable. So there are cases of true exploitation on the plains. But I, I, I think we have, you know, when Frank says we, you know, we've, we've mapped these things, we have not actually, though, in any sense, gone through and targeted and said, you know, your farm is doing this, and you know, you're good, and you're bad, and so on. We don't have a plan that's that specific in that sense that 
we, are, we, we aren't confusing submarginal, marginal, and so on. And those terms, I think, to, to get to your other questions, I think they're related. Because we're not, we're not designating anybody in, or anybody's lands on that specific basis. We're talking in general about different kinds of practices. And I think people in the area are going to have to figure out where they fit in these things. Um, it's not us who can do that, but uh, we're really talking about how can we rethink what's going on. We know, everybody knows, that there are, are difficulties in the region. And it's, you know, there are difficulties in the region we live in too, and we all need to rethink what it is that we're doing wherever we live to come up with better practices. So I, th I think that's, you know, that's a, kind of how I would respond. Right. Now, one, did one, we leave out one thing? Okay. One, one last quick point. The shift we are talking about from, if you will, extractive uses to preservation uses is happening anyway in the free market. It's happening in terms of, for example, population flows. It's happening in the rise of white buffalo ranchers throughout the Great Plains, having a history of running cattle, deciding cattle doesn't work for them, discovering that buffalo does work for them. All these kinds of changes, the Nature Conservancy biops, the Indian things Deborah was talking about, all would be happening regardless of whether Deborah and I had ever appeared on the scene at all. All we've really done is sort of observed it from the outside and chronicled it and coined a name to describe the overall process. The process would be happening in any case, even if we had never appeared on the scene. It's a deeper process that has anything to do with Deborah and me and our work. Why, why is the buffalo uh, more sustainable? Um, okay, I, I guess in general, I think that we're using, you know, we're, we use the term buffalo, and as I try to say, you know, I think that they, you know, they have an historic place in the region, um, but they do graze more widely, so you're less likely to overgraze. But you can overgraze. You put too many buffalo on too small a portion of land, and you can overgraze just the way you can with cattle. Um, but they will graze more widely. They will move out farther away from the rivers, um, and I, so I think those are two of the, the reasons. But you probably, in much of the region, you do need something that goes around and tramples the ground, and. If you don't have buffalo, you may want cattle. But I, I think that, that that's kind of why we think it would, it's a useful substitution. Uh, also, just in practical terms, they drink less water, they eat less grass, they're more easily moved, they're easier to calve. With a little foresight, the ranchers we've talked to have told us, in truth, it's an easier and shorter day to run buffalo than to run cattle. And in the end, you get better prices. We also, we've also started noticing some of the extension services of the area starting to move in this direction, we gather in the face of some considerable political resistance. Uh, thus, for example, North Dakota State University's extension, for the first time two months ago, in January was it, put out a pamphlet, you know, the standard kind of extension pamphlet, I imagine you're all familiar with, on how to raise buffalo in a very detailed and sort of in terms of sort of equipment requirements, feed requirements, and standard balance sheet, uh, and where to get further information. Uh, but it only did so after it discovered that perhaps, you know, 200 former cattle ranchers in the state were already in the Buffalo and were doing well and wanted more information and more people seemed likely to be going into the business. If the market is actually moving in this direction of its own volition. Uh, and while it may in the end turn out to be a niche market, it seems to be a very large niche whose exact dimensions nobody knows yet. Yeah, Mark. See, I want to come from the other direction talking about the free market. And it sounds like you are, you're talking about a buffalo free market rather than a buffalo commons. And what is, you know, whenever you have the introduction of a new crop or a new product on the market in the expansion oriented economy, you have the phenomenon of high prices in the beginning and the first people into it make money. And, and what's to prevent that from going the way of most successful products of going to the too much stage that you're criticizing the wheat and the cattle for? <laughs> 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 
can talk. Can you talk? You can talk. Yeah. Okay. You can talk if you want to. Yeah. Well, you can talk too. Yeah, this is the So this is always a problem we have two people answering the question. Okay, a couple things here. As this is developing, it's developing as Deborah described on a couple of different fronts. In some cases, you have, yes, private buffalo ranchers who may be in it just for the sort of standard economic motives, okay? Uh, and who are delighted to, to find that buffalo, at least for now, work better. There are, however, other fronts that Denver described on this, other sources of buffalo cultivation, other sources of buffalo production, and in some cases, other forms simply of having buffalo and running them free, not at all on a private farming kind of basis. So for example, you have the Indian things that were talked about, the Nature Conservancy experiments, in, for example, they're really getting to be larger than experiments in places like Texas or Nebraska or North Dakota. You can have, as we see, the Buffalo Commons set of land uses emerging, both private buffalo ranching you know, for economic reasons and free ranging buffalo elsewhere on much larger holdings that are there, or that, are, that are being run much more for preservation, uh, ecological kinds of reasons. So there are a whole bunch of different streams of the Buffalo Commons coming together here, and given the early stage that it's in, it's hard to know how each of the different streams will develop, how each of the different streams will relate to each other. But one does see, and this is the point I'd leave you with, a whole bunch of emerging Buffalo Commons land uses, all of which seem to be working better than any of their individual proponents would have predicted even two or three years ago. Uh, this is why Deborah is describing our work in 1987 as being almost, by now, historical antiquarian interest, because since 1990, things have moved very fast on all these other fronts. You're right with the point, the second point that you made, that buffalo ranching in itself, if conducted the wrong way, could go down many of the paths of the cattle industry that have proven so objectionable. It could happen, you're right. One of the things we're encouraged by is the fact that, for example, the folks that go into buffalo from cattle seem quite aware of the problem of what happens if you all of a sudden have all these, these middle people operate. They want to avoid that kind of thing. That's why they want to go, for example, in North Dakota and Kansas to a cooperative marketing arrangement quick, right? Rather than fall into some kind of middle person trap early, which seems to be their understanding of what's happened to cattle in their states. And they know the history of their industry is certainly better than I do. The possibilities, the traps that you're talking about, our possibility it could work that way, or it could turn out to be, you know, the actual economic niche, as it were, for market for, for, for Buffalo is smaller than anybody anticipates. But right now, there don't seem to be those limits there. And the folks in the Buffalo want to avoid the traps of the cattle industry, but they basically, as far as I can see, seem to be real happy to escape. And these are all former cattle people who are not about to go back. Right. I mean, in some sense, there. We, you know, this is this is again move, sort of moving into the future. You know, what will happen, and we don't really know. But one of the things that we have talked about with people, and that they have indicated to us, is that they know that the success of the buffalo industry depends on keeping the buffalo raised in a. You know, sort of, in a particular fashion that doesn't duplicate what's, what, what cat, the way the cattle are raised. So they don't want to shoot them up with all sorts of hormones and so on. As they can, because that will probably result in the market not working. Um, in, in which case, you know, what, why in fact go into something and, and develop it when it turns out you might as well stay with what you were doing before. Um, yeah, nobody's interested in the second form of people. So the people, at least at the moment, who are probably the leaders in the field, and they're fairly influential, are, we, we understand, going to be pretty careful um, about what goes on and, and use their influence as well as they can to, to maintain the industry in a way that keeps it successful, I suppose, as far as they're concerned. So, 
th there is some internal uh, pressure at this point for it to keep working in a, in a, in a, a somewhat more benevolent fashion. And both of you are well aware of the worldwide phenomenon of movement from the rural areas, population movement to the urban areas. And this is just a small uh, microcosm of this total planetary uh, picture of population movement that's been going on for some time. Uh, we're all aware of it. If, if what you say is true that market forces are driving this out, why don't we simply, uh, as a matter of national policy, withdraw these subsidies and let it take place in a very natural, sort of organic way, the way we did with the, with the mining towns, which are now cases tourist centers which says to itself and uh, some of the railroad towns but this happened uh, gradually and none of us were really too concerned about it uh, maybe the other side of the problem is where are these people going they're moving into Mexico City uh, and other urban areas yeah. around the world causing tremendous problems and I don't see these problems in the United states most people voluntarily are leaving and why is that such a monumental Maybe it's not. The urban problems are, are going to be catastrophic in our already. Uh, well, it, it certainly, I think that the, what we're talking about is a, you're right, a part of a larger phenomenon of this kind of movement. Um, and I think it does generate a certain amount of pain while it takes place. You know, certainly people in the region, you know, look at, some of their towns and say, and, and, and you know, they feel like their ancestors were there, came out, and they would like to stay there and don't feel that they can. Um, and that that is a painful process. Parents, you know, want their kids to come back and the kids don't come back, whatever. Uh, so I think they're, you know, it's not, it's not is it the, the hardest thing in the world? Perhaps not, but it is a process which, which in fact, in its, sort of natural workings out, I think does generate a certain amount of pain. Um, I think what we are saying that we're sort of tracking in some ways the process from the end of, okay, what's, what's happening? And then are there ways that you can ameliorate it in some ways? Are there kinds of practices that can go out into these areas that will make them um, more viable? than they are, which may in fact retain people in the area to do somewhat different things. Well, why is it lost if these areas become uh, empty, empty of people and empty? What, what is the loss of the worldwide movements are to the cities? Why, why do we have to have people in every square mile of the Earth's surface? Well, actually, so something I'm picking up from your question, which I'm really enjoying. It is, is this this comparative perspective? You're absolutely right that what's happening on the Great Plains is not the people catastrophe that, let's say, Mexico City or Sao Paulo or Karachi. Uh, there's a much smaller number of people involved. They're, for better or for worse, less visible on the nation's screen of attention. And as far as we can tell, the people who are leaving the plains tend, or the, 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 the deep rural, more difficult part of the plains, tend to be going either to more stable rural areas within the plains, or to the large cities of the plains, or larger cities right on the edge of the plains, say the Minneapolis and so forth, of the world. It's not the wrenching, human, you know, slum-creating thing one, one, one sees and hear, hears about in your example. Uh, Mexico City. Uh, but it is a population movement of some size occurring in an area of some considerable historic and cultural and mythic resonance. But you're right, it's not the problem of East St. Louis or uh, It's not that at that level of danger. And at some level, I'm suddenly feeling better about what our work because of your question. Yes? Um, you mentioned that it's an evolutionary process uh, in Montana. I could sort of see a, a sorting process, this exodus, where people that are left, and the same thing's happening now, I mean, people who are left are the most uh, rich, most powerful, most shrewd, and most stubborn uh, holders. So that 
And we have been in the past with wealthy ranchers that have large gold mines. And uh, I guess I'm trying to be kind of like I think it is significant. I, you know, what, what we're doing is, I, I can have a personal response to that, which is, you know, I, I don't know that I think that this should be a preserve for rich people. Um, so that's my own political judgment. Uh, and so I would like to see some other, you know, that, that other people who want to stay there also get that opportunity. But that, that, that's my own political judgment, certainly. If, if, if I could try that one a little bit. What you're talking about, you're absolutely right, is happening in some places on the plains, in terms of rich people, especially outside rich people, in terms of you know, usual exhibit A, it, 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 it makes sense. The fact is, though, that Ted Turner's of the world are not really attracted, let us say, to western Kansas or to western Oklahoma. Okay? It's just not that attractive. I mean, Ted Turner's ranch, in fact, uh, it's not quite in the plains, it's actually in the mountains and Gallatin Gateway, if I recall. A little bit outside the area we're talking about. Uh, however, your idea of a local, stubborn, sometimes wealthy, sometimes we think not so wealthy, elite, is much more accurate. And my sense is what keeps those people there is sheer stubbornness. Frequently you're talking about people who are not making that much money at all, but they just like the lifestyle. And that's what keeps them there, and we get it, Deborah and I get into arguments with them. They say they're going to stay, they're going to run cattle. We got no problem with it as long as you know they're doing it, they're doing it, you know, to their own, their own satisfaction. Our sense is, however, that in some places, and, and here certainly Kansas and Oklahoma might be better examples than, than say the more the parts of the plains that have views of the Montana mountains. But this local elite is finding it harder and harder to find. And it's these economic pressures we're talking about, and the environmental pressures, and perhaps in coming years, the government subsidy pressures, uh, that is really going to squeeze this elite, which is much less strong, certainly in national politics, than it was at a time when say, farming and ranching was bigger in, farming, in national politics or even in state politics. The actual influence of such people is shrinking even within their own states. Colorado and Texas would be particularly good examples because they're especially urban plain states coming around. But our sense is this is a kind of, you're right, it's a local elite, but it's a local elite which in many places is losing a certain amount of its power and withdrawing, as it were, from larger state or national politics. And the influence of this elite it's not strong enough to prevent the deeper structure forces we're talking about from creating something like a buffalo commons in many places, even as this elite resists it, and even as in some places this elite may join. Does, does that help? Yeah. Okay. The power of this elite is what strikes me as a manager. The politicians. Okay, but even, even in, in Montana, for example, the latest congressional election, which had this fascinating thing yeah, right. about the liberal Democrat from Western, more environmental, more urban, uh, more timber-oriented Montana, running against the conservative Republican on flat plains. Yeah, and I illustrate your point. Right. Yeah, and, and, and the, you know, the Western liberal de environmental Democrat wins out over the wise guy from from eastern Montana for the one seat that is left in the state. You know, the two of them have to run against each other and only one can survive. And, you know, the tilt in Montana politics goes in, I wouldn't say a Buffalo Commons direction, but let's call it an environmentalist direction in a way that would have been inconceivable, say, 15 years ago. Yeah, yeah. But, it, yeah but it wouldn't have even been close. Right. Yes, ma'am. 
mean, I think that the costs have gone up, and so there indeed has been an increase in conservation through most of the plain states, uh, in fact. In con conservation of, of water, of water, yeah. Uh, that there's less, say, if you went back 10 years ago, I think it's a 10, I can't, something like that. If you looked at how much uh, and what the practices were about a decade ago, they would have been more wasteful than the present practices. So there is an attempt not to use things up, as, not to use the water up as fast. What, did you want to say? Yeah, you were just The Rutgers is in New Jersey, and there seems to be lately this odd sort of New Jersey fascination with the Great Plains, which I have no explanation for. That's a complicated way of saying that a fellow at the New Jersey Institute of Technology, a historian, John Olby, is about to come out with a history of local law and accuracy. And his argument basically incorporates pieces of what you're both saying. Right. There's been more conservation lately, but there's a wall out there that's likely to be hit fairly soon. Yeah, he, does, he looks at some specific uh, ranches, actually, I guess. Well, he, he does a couple of case studies. And um, it, in, the, if I recall, Oklahoma, the yeah. panhandle Kansas of Oklahoma. And, Texas. And, and what he has found is that those particular people have a very comfortable life at this point based on very heavy water use. Um, and they know it will come to an end because uh, the only way they can do what they're doing is really a, a, a depleting way. And they, they know it will come to an end. They're going to keep it up until it comes to an end and their next generation won't be able to do it. Uh, you know, it's, it's sort of a, a sort of fatalist way of looking at it. So, uh, you know, clearly that attitude exists out there, as well as you know, some attempts in other places where the people think perhaps if we're a little more careful, we can extend this and it won't be so bad. I mean, I think there's a, a yeah. mix going around. One thing I also remember from the work that might be relevant here, Texas is an especially heavy user of the overall aquifer story. And conservation instincts in Texas, for complicated reasons, are less than they are in, say, Kansas or Nebraska. And Texas is more urban than some of the others. The P2 and the urban areas can be the rural areas. Uh, my recollection, I may be misremembering what I have to say, but it's far the most extensive study of this, is that the Texas wall that's going to be hit is going to loom up soonest. And all and that the problems in Texas that are coming up will be much worse than some of what will happen in Nebraska or Kansas, simply because of the you know, Dallas and Houston and El Paso and San Antonio's ability to outbid uh, for, for groundwater. It's a standard Western pattern. Up. They look exhausted. Thank you. Thank you.